I don't always choose to be a bastard, but when I do, I prefer to choose to be a bastard. That way, I can really savour it when I torment Luigi, or drag someone behind my horse in Red Dead, or hilariously prank my LAPD partner. <laughs> Sorry, no, no, this time I'll let you get in. For real this time. Psych! <laughs> Which is why I don't appreciate it when a game forces me, 99% guaranteed non-bastard Mike Channel, to do something really terrible without giving me a say. I might have said yes! Now we'll never know. Consider these misdeeds for which I cannot be held responsible and beware spoilers for the following games. Logo, who are we up against? An army? Give or take? No sh How are we getting through this? If video games have taught us nothing else, it's that war is fun and crime is fun. Yet somehow, war crime's not fun. I know. Weird, right? As if to prove the point and really show you how it's not just another fun war game, Spec Ops The Line leads you down the garden path into committing one such atrocity, where the garden path is a bleak and sandy descent into madness amidst the wreckage of Dubai. We've been set up. Welcome to hell, Walker. There comes a pivotal moment in the game where to make progress into a fortified area, you must bombard the enemy with white phosphorus. This might help. Fine, set it up. Kidding, right? That's white phosphorus. White phosphorus is a very nasty substance that ignites on contact with air and burns rapidly. As a weapon, it is devastating, and it is banned by the UN for use over inhabited areas because of the potential for the indiscriminate burning of civilians. With all this in mind, protagonist Martin Walker must give this decision to bombard the opposition with white phosphorus serious thought. There's always a choice. No, there's really not. Or maybe not. Or maybe, if it's the Martin Walker we were playing, he walks around for a long while seeing if there's anything else he can do except for pressing A to do a white phosphorus. There is not. If you didn't already have the sneaking suspicion that this was a terrible move from the reluctance of your buddy Lugo, or the distant screams of the enemy while you gaze at the targeting monitor, then you surely got the picture from the hellish, smoking vista you walk through afterwards. Boy, he's already dead. And if not, then the icing on the extremely grim cake is the revelation that there were a bunch of helpless civilians taking shelter in the back, whose charred corpses spec ops the line spares no detail in rendering. Are those... civilians? Mm-hmm. At the time, we did resent being railroaded into doing something this unspeakable, but it probably does say something about the inescapable horrors of war and how civilians are the inevitable victims that we didn't get any choice in the matter. Also, we did choose to keep playing Spec Ops The Line, so I guess that is on us. There's no way to know how many of the captain's loyal men are guarding the place, but the household will probably be in an uproar over the captain's death. With luck, no one will notice me sneaking around. The widow Moira might know where her late husband kept his treasures. Maybe I'll start by paying her a little visit. When you're playing a game that is literally called Thief, some amount of theft is to be expected. It'd be like having a Tomb Raider game in which you didn't raid any tombs, or a Bioshock game in which you didn't shock anyone's bios. <laughs> Unimaginable. That being said, you don't necessarily have to steal absolutely everything that isn't nailed down. Sure, you have thievery quotas to hit, this is a business after all, but Thief Deadly Shadows does occasionally throw a moral quandary or two your way, and lets you make a decision about who needs the riches you're out to pilfer more. Take for example the mission The House of the Widow Moira, in which your character Garrett infiltrates the mansion of a recently deceased sea captain in order to steal a mystical MacGuffin called the Compendium of Reproach, which I believe was the original name for TripAdvisor. As you explore the house, you'll discover that Captain Moira's widow, Edwina, is still alive, and things aren't going great for her. She's blind, she's confined herself to a tower where she speaks as if her husband was still alive. Bryant tells me you've left a message for me on the Victrola. Really, Robert, can't you just tell me yourself? Her servants refuse to bring her any wine. You'll never believe it, Robert. 
The servants have had the impertinence to refuse me a glass of wine. And her house guests are trying to rob her. If you were the widow Moira, where would you keep your late husband's telescope? Hey, it's different when I do it. Eventually, you discover that the compendium you're after is hidden alongside a nest egg of cash that Captain Moira left to provide for Edwina if he should die at sea. You're free to choose whether or not to take the money, a hefty 500 coin, but it feels like canonically, Garrett, being the gentleman thief that he is, would surely not choose to leave a poor widow totally destitute. Hopefully, most players would choose to leave that be and just take the compendium. That's got to be the compendium. And as a result of your kindness, later in the game she'll even send you a nice bottle of wine to thank you. How nice! Of course, that's unless you're playing Thief Deadly Shadows on the hardest difficulty setting, Expert. If you are, the House of the Widow Moira has a 90% loot requirement, which means that if you want to finish the level, you have to steal the Widow's inheritance whether you want to or not. There's no way around committing this horrible deed, and to make things worse, if you do, instead of sending a bottle of wine your way, the aggrieved widow instead sends an assassin to kill you and try and get the money back. Hey, don't blame me! It was the game! I just wanted to rob her a regular amount. These people came here to fight. For you. How much wolf Spain can you find in the next hour? A few handfuls. Talk to the others. Tell them to gather all you can carry. For a game with the word ghost literally in the title, implying a sort of quiet efficiency, Sony's Samurai game is extremely judgy about you using stealth to get stuff done. When we fight, we face our enemy head on. When we take their life, we look them in the eye with courage and respect. Look, it's called Ghost of Tsushima, not super obvious walks right up to you guy of Tsushima. In spite of stealth being absolutely the most efficient way to get through the game, you can respect your uncle's wishes and act with honour by engaging your enemies in head-on combat rather than stabbing them in the back like a coward. I'm gonna use that excuse in every stealth game from now on. No, I didn't f*** up and accidentally alert the guards, I was acting with honour. This is all well and good until you get to the end of Act 2 in the mission From the Darkness, at which point no matter how much you've been living by your uncle's code, your player character, Jin Sakai, decides it's time to unleash the bastard within. I can find a way past the bridge. Poison the enemy. An act of terror. For the entire mission, you're forced to be stealthy. If you raise the alarm, you instantly fail the mission, meaning you are only ever going to be killing guards dishonorably. And that's before you do as you said you would and poison their drink supply and cause the rest of the castle's guards to violently projectile vomit blood everywhere. Yeah, not feeling super honourable about that. Naturally, your honour-loving uncle is extremely pissed off when he arrives to find the entire enemy force rolling around on the floor, throwing up their insides, and gives you a stern and probably deserved telling off. Is this how you want to be remembered? I mean, he does have a point. I'm not sure that guy who caused an entire enemy army to puke themselves to death of Tsushima is going to fit on the game box. Don't worry about me, Mr. Marston. I'm living in history. I'm not afraid to die. Your nobility is almost as affecting as your naivete. I would rather be dead than a cynic like you, Mr. Marston. Red Dead Redemption is about former outlaw John Marston attempting to leave behind his checkered criminal past. As a result, over the course of the game, player character John mostly tries to act with honour, helping people in need, bringing members of his old gang to justice, and successfully resisting the overwhelming temptation to shoot snake oil salesman Nigel West Dickens in the face. What you are, dear boy, is the man whose life I've saved twice now. A man who sells lies and deceit to unwitting people. A man who, if he doesn't help me, I won't think twice about putting a bullet through his skull. Hey, he's called Nigel West Dickens, not Nigel West Nice Guyans. As such, it is possible to play through the majority of Red Dead Redemption feeling like a fundamentally good guy. There's even a morality system in the game to keep you on the straight and narrow, discouraging you from going around the place stealing horses, attacking lawmen, and tying innocent NPCs up on the railway tracks. I swear, I only did it to get the footage. 
All that falls apart a bit when you head to Mexico and end up playing both sides of a national revolution off against each other. On the one hand, you have the plucky, disenfranchised peasant rebels, characterized by people like Luisa, who fight for their freedom. Mr. Marston, my father was killed yesterday. The army found him and accused him of treason. And on the other hand, you have obvious jerkhole and power hoarding tyrant Colonel Allende. Don't be so conventional. Ah, look at that ass, huh? Magnificent. I've seen more nuanced takes on good versus evil in Saturday morning cartoons. Although it feels like you might at some point have a choice of who to side with during the revolution, or that the game will make the right choice for you, in reality you had to continue working for both the rebels and the Mexican army. That leads to missions like the one called Demon Drink, where you kill a bunch of rebels and then are asked to burn their village down. Make sure they don't have homes to come back to. There are fire bottles over there. Use them to burn down some of these houses. And what makes you think I'd do that? But hey, it's a mandatory story mission objective, so off you trot to torch an entire village, including the church. Something you can tell from John's face, even he knows, is a real dick move. Isn't that beautiful? You really are pathetic. It's not enough to put him off continuing to work for Allende, though, and in the next mission you end up seizing a rebel fort and then having a conversation with Allende's right-hand man, Captain DeSanta, while doing your level best to ignore the very obvious firing squad executions going on in the background. A killer like you, uh, deserves fine women and wine. How's that redemption going then, John? Good? To the untrained eye, like for example that of the rapper Soldier Boy, Braid appears to just be a regular platform game about nothing. It's about this little guy in a, in a suit and he walking around and he ain't got no point to the game. Thanks Soldier Boy. The comparisons to the Mario Brothers games are obvious, with Braid's unique twist being that main character Tim is able to manipulate time. Starting on stage 2 with the ability to rewind time, more and more time powers are added throughout the game as Tim carries out his quest to save a princess who has been snatched by what the game describes as a horrible and evil monster. As the game goes on and you're enjoying jumping on enemies' heads and messing with the time flow, we learn more about the relationship between Tim and the princess, a relationship that is slowly revealed to have been jealous, possessive and overshadowed by an unspecified mistake that Tim had made. Which, I mean, you can rewind time, Tim. Why not just use that to undo the mistake? I do it all the time. See? In the final level, however, there is a twist that reveals that everything you've been doing in the game so far might not be as noble and pure as you've been led to believe. For anyone who's played a Mario game, it starts out pretty straightforward. The princess escapes from the clutches of a brutish foe, she flees, and you follow underneath as she disables traps for you to help you reach her and ensure her safety. When you do finally catch up to her though, everything changes. This is when you realise that in fact everything in the level except for you has been running in reverse. The princess is actually running away from you, she's setting the traps to try and slow you down, and the knight at the beginning who you thought had kidnapped her? He was waiting for her, ready to help her escape the horrible and evil monster otherwise known as you. So while you thought you were out to rescue a kidnapped princess, you were actually being a horrible stalker the whole time. Sucks to be you, I guess. There are other interpretations of Braid's story, and its creator, Jonathan Blow, has even said that he couldn't explain the real story adequately in human words. But then that's the sort of thing he says all the time. And they got no point to the game. Well, one of them is right. We'll let you decide which one. I was shackled and collared and sent to Fort Joy. I'd come here to kill Godwoken. But instead, I became part of their story. One of the toughest decisions in any RPG is deciding who's going to be included in your adventuring party as you strike out to save the world. In Divinity Original Sin 2, that decision seems easier than most. You pick the big, posh red lizard guy, and two others, I guess. I am the Red Prince, the All Conqueror, the World Tamer, the Spouse of the Sun. And I'm Mike. Welcome to the team. 
In spite of the obviousness of this particular choice, Divinity 2 is actually pretty generous when it comes to locking in your decision. The game gives you the whole of Act 1 to test out the companion characters, get to know them, and decide on your favourites. At the end of Act 1 though, as you depart on the ship Lady of Vengeance, you will be made to whittle down that party to a final four members. Hey, there are parties I've not been invited to. It's not so bad. Hours and hours later, in Act 3, you'll head into the Chamber of the One during the quest known as the Academy, and you'll be reunited with the party members you rejected at the end of Act 1. The bad news is that they have thrown their lot in with the evil God King and are now creepy undead skeletons. Hey there, Chief. Miss me? Nice to see you again. Have you lost weight? To make matters worse, they're all furious at you for rejecting them, even though you were unable to create a party bigger than four people even if you wanted to, and you weren't warned that there would be any negative consequences from your choice. When one friend turns their back on you, another turns toward you with open arms. You left me to die. The God King offered me a new life. Quite an easy choice of allegiances, isn't it? I may have left you to die, but he has made you actually dead. I feel like we're splitting hairs here. Either way, if the game's goal is to make us feel bad for something we had no control over, well then mission accomplished. And then, to really ladle on the guilt, you're then forced to face and destroy those same rejected, bitter, now undead companions in battle in the arena of the one. Still, fewer companions means fewer people around to judge when you romance that posh lizard. What? He's very charming. Did I just watch, you rightly ask. Friends, that was 2001 PC adventure game, The Mystery of the Druids. Which begins with the kind of feverish intensity and supernatural druid immolating menace that makes it hard to believe that just 30 minutes later you will find yourself puttering around in modern day Oxford trying to solve the puzzle of how to use a public payphone and complaining about BT call charges. Telephone charges of British Telecom, so nobody forgets how expensive it is to use the phone. Got him. As police detective Brent Halligan, you must investigate a series of grisly killings known as the Skeleton Murders. As I said, I'm working on the Skeleton Murders. These are misleadingly not murders committed by an angry skeleton, but murders in which all that remains of each victim is a pile of bones. Are there any useful traces? Hardly any traces at all, sir. To catch the killer, you must call an anthropologist to have her analyse a bone from the most recent victim, hence the trip to the phone booth. For our younger viewers, a phone booth is kind of a huge stationary cell phone that you get inside and feed money to, and also it smells bad. Hashtag history facts. Before he can place a call, however, Detective Halligan is going to need to steal money from a homeless man, because Detective Halligan isn't the kind of person who carries cash, or has access to his own cash, or is convicted about stealing cash from the unhoused. Mightn't you have a couple of pounds for me? Sorry, I've got no money on me. Bad enough that as the player you have no choice but to steal this man's precious few coins, but worse still, the only way to do it is by poisoning this vulnerable individual. I've lost everything. Everything. No money, no flat, no future. I'm finished. Simply finished. This seems fine. By taking the man's empty flask and filling it with a mixture of apple juice and medical grade ethanol, which I don't need to tell you likely contains toxic methanol impurities, you create a grim bootleg cider, which, when gratefully accepted and drunk by the homeless man, renders him immediately unconscious. Cheers, <laughs> mister. Cheers. Whether the man is dead or simply unconscious, we can't be sure, but his pixels certainly are unmoving, as vagrant mugger Brent Halligan nicks the coins out of his hat and legs it, and thusly you acquire the money you need to make the call. Scotland Yard, what can I do for you? Uh, stop me before I kill again? It's not easy to get in touch with you. I was close to giving up. Thank you so much for watching this video about seven times you were forced to be a bastard. There's always a choice, Mike. There's always a choice, and there's a choice right now. You could. Click on one of the two videos up here, one from us, 
from Outside Xbox and one down here from Outside Extra. You could have stopped playing the game, you could have just walked away. I, Andy, come on. You could have just turned it off. Yeah, it's oh, true. No. It's true. You had to go but to I, <laughs> like Andy, I had to romance that posh lizard. Um, if you like this, please do join the OX Supporters Club at patreon.com slash OX Club to help support what we do. Thanks for watching. Bye. Redress the karmic balance. <laughs>